morning. Uh, in case we haven't met, my name is Paul Horsmeyer. As Kendall mentioned, I'm the site pastor at Kimberly Way, and I've been here almost a year now. Uh, so very excited, coming on the one-year anniversary. But I love this church. I love this church so much. I'm so grateful to be here with you this morning. Uh, it was a day to forget an umbrella. Boy, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad I'm here. I've been pretty much dried off. Um, yeah, we are continuing on in our series uh, in the book of Ephesians called Life in Light of Eternity. Uh, so to prepare ourselves for this time, would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, um, you are the giver of life. Thank you for the life that we have in your son. But I pray for all of us in this room that your Holy Spirit would be with us to give us the peace that we need, to give us ears to hear your word, that we would know what it means to have life in you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start out with a question, okay? It's a simple one. You ready? Are you alive? Are you alive? Yes, right, 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 yes. Um, yeah, I mean, if you could say you're alive, you are alive, right? And, I mean, if you can show me that you've got a pulse, that you're breathing, you know, you're thinking, really easy to show me and tell me that you are alive. And now, if that's all I was asking about, whether you have a pulse or not, then this would be nothing more than just a weird conversation starter, Right? But when I'm asking this question, I'm talking about something a little bit more complicated, um, something maybe deeper and, and different altogether. Because you could ask someone this question, and they could respond with something like this. Yes, but I feel dead inside. Yes, I am alive, but honestly, I feel like I'm dead. Now, this answer should not make sense, right? This answer should not make sense. But yet, I think we all get what this answer is getting at. There's a song that came out a number of years ago, uh, very popular. It's, at this point, it's got about 3.8 billion views on YouTube, so that's a lot. Uh, And it's got this line in it. Everything that kills me makes me feel alive. Everything that kills me makes me feel alive. Now, I see this line, I think about the millions, if not billions of people that have listened to this song, and something's resonating. But they understand that, like, while they have a pulse, there's something wrong. They, they don't really feel alive, and so they need to seek out things that, honestly, would, would kill them just to feel alive. Or think about, think about people who experience a midlife crisis. Uh, now, this is something that we all know um, as, a, as a phenomenon. Maybe you know some people that have experienced this. Maybe you've experienced this yourself, a midlife crisis. Now, what causes someone to go through something like that? I would say it's because they're wrestling with this question, you know, are you alive? And they're like, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, I've gotten up to this point, and what do I have to show for it? And what exactly is left in store for me? I mean, what is this life? Is this it? Is this it? Is this what life is? Is this what it means to be alive? And it's not just midlife. There's a popular special on Netflix right now called Quarter Life Crisis. So it's getting worse, okay? (laughs) We don't know what we're doing. We don't know what it means to be alive. So again, I ask that question, are you alive? And it's like, yeah, but are you? But are you? We're asking this question not only because it is an important one to ask, but it's actually the question that gets to the heart of our scripture passage for today. This is the very question that Ephesians chapter 2 is asking, but it also gives us some answers some ways to answer this question, are you alive? And there are three that I want us to, to focus on. So in the first three verses, we see the answer, I am alive, but I'm dead. And in verses four to seven, we see the answer, I'm alive with Christ. 
In the last verses, we see the answer, I'm alive for good. And so I want to state it up front. The first answer is not the answer I want you to have, even if it's the answer that you would give right now. That's not the answer we want to we wanna have. The answer we want is the second one, that I'm alive with Christ. And if you have that one, if you have that one, then you can also have that third answer, that I'm alive for good. And so that's my goal, that's my hope, is that you can walk away from today answering that question, are you alive with, I'm alive with Christ. So that means I'm alive for good. And we're going to see what that means as we walk through this text this morning. So we're going to start with that first answer in the first verse. It says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. So right here we see, you're dead, but you were alive. Okay, dead, but alive. And so, obviously what it's talking about is even though you have a pulse, there's something that's very wrong. That you are physically alive, but spiritually, you're dead. And when I think about this this reality for people, um, when I think about being physically alive but spiritually dead, This is the image that comes to mind. Now, this is not one of my plants. It very well could have been. Uh, I'm terrible with keeping plants alive, unfortunately. But looking at this plant, is this plant alive? Eh, kind of. Eh. But it doesn't look like it's having a good time. Right? Right? I mean, this plant is in some desperate need of some tender, loving care, right? This plant needs some water. And so when I think about people who would give a response like this, like, I'm alive, but I feel like I'm dead, this is what I think of. And it breaks my heart that they're holding on, they're barely holding on. And that the reason for this is that they're cut off from their source of life. They're cut off from their source of life, they're far from God. At least they feel far from God. And the life that God is supposed to give and be, that's not in their life. And what is in their life, unfortunately, is what the rest of this section talks about. And reading it again, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, And all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. And so right here, we see the three biggest enemies we could ever face. The three biggest enemies. The ways of this world, the devil, called the ruler of the kingdom of the air, here, and our own sinful flesh, the worst parts of ourselves, the world, the devil, our sinful nature, all laid out, that these, these forces are the reasons why we can be alive and yet feel like we're dead. And let me make very clear, this is not just a problem for unbelievers. This is a problem for people who call themselves Christians too. This is probably a problem for you. Because Even though, if you call yourself a Christian, do these three enemies go away? No, they don't go away. In fact, now you've got a big target on your back, if you are a Christian. Now they're working overtime, because they want nothing more than to pull you away from life, to crowd you in with death, to kill and disconnect you from the source of life. These things are all around. We deal with them throughout our whole lives. And so again, you can be Christian and still say, I I know I'm alive, but I feel like I'm dead. I am barely holding on. What is this all about? Is this life? And so you can imagine how bad it gets when someone really gives in to these things. And maybe you've got stories in your personal life, people you've encountered. You've definitely seen it in the news. When all of a sudden now, if a person's really at the center of their universe and they're in the driver's seat of their life and they've got three, you know, backseat drivers of the devil, the world, and the sinful nature, 
It is chaos. It's destruction. People get used and abused, exploited, and thrown away. That's what happens when someone is following these things. It's terrible for everyone. The death of their life spreads to others. And so I hope it's clear by now. This first answer is not a good answer. I do not want this to be any of your answer. I don't want you to be physically alive but spiritually dead. It's bad news for everyone. So where's the hope? Where's the hope? Well, that's what we see in the next verses. With the second answer of what does it mean to be alive with Christ? Okay, here's what we read. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God made us alive with Christ. Now, sitting with this section, trying to see, well, okay, what what are the most important parts that we should focus on? And it's like, well, the whole thing, the whole thing, it's like, this is a seven-course meal right here. This is like, this is every single thing that is so foundational to our faith in just a few short verses. But I, there are still some things that I want us to point out and focus on and appreciate. Um, first, there's this word that comes up a number of times. And it's this word, with. Again, made us alive with Christ. Raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. And I don't know about you, but for me, when I think about faith and life and trying to be a Christian and follow God, oftentimes I don't feel like Jesus and God, I don't feel like they're with me. I feel like I'm all alone sometimes. But look at what it says here. That when you are made alive with Christ, Christ is with you. Where Jesus is, there you are. And where you are, Jesus is right there with you. And not just here in a sense, but I mean, look at what, look at what he says. And, and look at these few descriptions that he has. That God's made us alive, he's raised us up, and seated us with Christ. Seated us with Christ in the heavenly realms. Now, Christ is seated as scripture says, at the right hand of God. That means, you know, that's not how we think in, in terms of today, but back in, back in that time, to be seated at someone's right hand was to say that you had the highest place of authority. That's where Christ is seated in heaven, at the highest place of authority. And look at what St. Paul is saying. We're seated there with him. What? I mean, come on. Do you, do you wake up and say, I am seated with Christ right now in heaven? Probably not, but you should. I mean, this, this promise, this reality that, that, that he's talking about, it's so counter to what our day-to-day life is like. But it's the truth. And look at what tense these verbs are in, past, present, or future. What, what tense are these verbs in, past, present, or future? Past tense, past tense. This is already done. This is already the case for you. You are already made alive with Christ. I don't know whether you feel like it or not, you are already made alive with Christ. You're already alive. And all the things in this world, well, your life is seated with Christ in heaven, safe from those things. You're already alive. And to top it all off, all of these things that are true, how do they happen? How did they happen? It was all God's doing. Again, this little little line, it is by grace you have been saved. It is by grace you have been saved. To show that the person who made all this happen for you, the person who made you alive and did more than you could have ever even imagined, God did it. He did it all for you. 
now again, this, this line, it's by grace you have been saved. This is a line that if you've been in church for some time, you've heard this before. It, it's one of the most common, maybe, phrases that you could hear at church. But have you really ever stopped and kind of sat with this phrase and asked yourself, like, what, what does this mean? What does it really mean to be saved by grace? I mean, this is, like, foundational. This is foundational, to be saved by grace. And just to help give some, some language and some ways to think about what this means, to really appreciate this, I want to share kind of one of my working definitions of being saved by grace, okay? It's to say that we have a life with Christ, and that is an undeserved and unconditioned gift. That our life with Christ is an undeserved and unconditioned gift. So those two words in particular, I really want to make sure we're on the same page with, undeserved and unconditioned. So first, undeserved. All right, who here loves group projects? Right? Nothing better. Nothing better. Okay, show of hands. Who is the one that did the work? None of you did the work, so you let someone else do the work? Yes, I know. I've been both of those things in my time. Yeah, group projects. So let's just say your eternal life was a group project. And the two people in your group are you and Jesus. And let's say you didn't show up to a single meeting, you didn't lift a finger, you contributed zero. Okay, zero. You missed everything, you didn't do anything. In fact, you worked against it oftentimes. But imagine Jesus, he got right to work. And he worked nonstop. And when it started costing a lot, he was willing to pay the price. When it cost his own life, he was willing to give it. He was willing to give it for your eternal life. And let's say at the end of the day, all the work is done. Jesus has done it all. Who deserves to get the credit? Whose name deserves to be on that that group project? Really only Jesus, right? But then Jesus says, you put your name there. You put your name there. In fact, I'll put your name there. Let me put your name there. You can take all the credit. But I didn't do anything to deserve it. I know. I know. You can take all the credit. Take all the credit. This is yours. This is yours. And for all of us that maybe hated the people who didn't pull their weight in a group project now, it sounds pretty good, right? This is entirely yours. Undeserved gift. So what about <clears throat> this word unconditioned? Why did I choose that word? Because the word that maybe is a little bit more common, especially talking about this kind of thing, is unconditional, right? Like unconditional love, unconditional grace, all, everything. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that word either, <clears throat> a little bit more common, but I heard someone say uh, sometime recently that there's some danger with how people will talk about the unconditional love and grace of God. Because sometimes they'll talk about God's love being unconditional in the sense that they use it as an excuse. They use it as an excuse to still live the way that they want to live and still say, yeah, but I'm saved. It doesn't really matter. God loves me unconditionally. No strings attached. But with this word unconditioned, the way I understand it is we are totally saved, all God's work. We didn't do anything to deserve it, 100% ours. But there is one string attached. And it's a string that attaches us to Jesus. And here's what I mean. So if you recognize this picture and this little toy spork, good for you. Um, I have a three-year-old, so I know who is on the screen here. But this is Forky from Toy Story 4. Okay, Toy Story 4, if you haven't seen it, highly recommend. Um, Forky here is a, is a toy um, made from parts of the trash, kind of knit together, and Bonnie puts her name on 
you know, his little popsicle stick foot there, and he becomes a toy. Okay? So here's Forky. He's this toy made from the trash. And <laughs> he joins all the other toys, you know, Buzz and Woody and everyone else. But every time he sees a trash can, you know what he wants to do? Run back and jump into the trash. He says, I'm trash. I'm trash. And he runs and jumps into the trash. And I know it's kind of silly, but I was like, this is so incredibly profound. <laughs> you know, who would have thought? Pixar. Uh, but again, God has redeemed us. He saved us from the things that want to kill us. He saved us from those things. He's put his name on us. Right? He's taken us from the trash. He said, you are a new creation. You're a new creation. You're alive. You're alive. You're a new creation. So why are you going back to those things? Why do you go back to those things that lead to death? That's not who you are. That's not who you are. It reminds me of what it says in Romans chapter 6. And I love this. This is so important. And it gets at this very idea. After talking about how free and abundant God's grace is, uh, he feels a need to say this. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that. In order that. Okay? In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. God has made you alive and he wants you to stay that way. God has made you alive and he wants you to live like it. And when he looks from heaven, when he has his eternal perspective, he sees his beloved child who is fully alive, who is fully alive because all that he has done, he sees someone he loves and adores. And when he sees you running back to the trash, he's like, no, that's not, that's not, what, I, that's not what I give you life for. I want you to live. I want you to live. This life is yours. Live like it. That's what it means to be alive with Christ. And the key way that we live and embrace this life that we've been given is what we find in the last few verses here from verses 8 to 10. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Okay, so notice, we're not saved by works. We're not saved by works, makes that very clear. But we are saved for good works. We are saved for something, to do good. And for all the confusion that can be with, with good works and what are these, what aren't they, I think of good works as anything that's good for others, and that glorifies God. Okay, anything. So yeah, it's the big stuff that we could do, but it's all the little things too. That this is exactly what God has prepared for us. So again, when I think about this reality, I think about after a nice dinner at home, and what is there but a pile of dishes in the kitchen sink, right? Huge, overflowing. And I look at that pile of dishes in the sink, and I say, that is a good work I do not want to do, <laughs> right? Much more of a laundry person. Uh, that is not a kind of good work <laughs> that I want to do. <laughs> but I remember that this is kind of what I'm made for, okay? And is this a good thing? You know, going back to the criteria, is this a good thing? Would this, would this be good for my family to do these chores, to do these dishes? Yeah, it would. Let's go to Mary, my wife, is usually the cook, and she's prepared a delicious meal. Uh, my kids are way too young to help out anyways. 
So would this be good? Yeah, this would be good. And would this glorify God? Well, I can do it in a way that doesn't glorify God. I can tell you that much. I could do it and feel really good about it and hold it over Mary's head be like, well, I, I did that for you, so that's pretty much, I'm done helping out for a week, at least. I mean, you owe me that much, right? You could do a good work in a bad way, right? So to do a good work in a way that glorifies God, I can come to those dishes, and as I'm doing it, I can, I can thank God. I can thank God for the food that we got to eat. I can thank God for the people that I got to eat this meal with. I can thank God for the clean water that I have to, to clean these dishes. I can thank God for this wonderful life that I would not trade for anything. Where my kids don't eat any of their food and they just throw it around. <laughs> I've got an amazing family and a house and so many things that God has given me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that I can do these dishes. Right? And I know I'm a little bit of a softy, but I mean, it is that powerful. These are the things we're made for. And so God has prepared something good for you today. Whether it's asking someone how they're doing, calling a friend that's hurting, you know, making your, your kids laugh or someone laugh. There's a good work that God's prepared for you. And the invitation is to remember before anything else, that you're taken care of. You're taken care of. You have nothing to prove. You have nothing to fear. You got nothing to lose because you're alive. You are alive with Christ. So you're alive for good. That's the answer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for making us alive in your Son before we ever even asked for it. You gave everything for us. You want us to know that we are alive in you and with you. So help us to remember that today and every day. Amen.